Yes, hello everybody. Um, I have a great pleasure to introduce Evie, who will talk about power efficiency of servers. Evie works at the National Institute of Subatomic Physics of in the Netherlands. Um, in his free time, he participates in the Internet Manufacturer, so the geeks can enjoy Internet on CCC events. So, great guy. And in the last years, he and his co-workers um, did a lot of... She. She, sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. That's right. She um, and her co-workers uh, measured how much energy their servers actually consume and will talk about some insights by Gazat in that process. Again, yes. sorry for the... No, mistake. it's fine. And enjoy. Have okay. a nice talk. Have a ni interesting insights. Bye-bye. Wow. So yes, um, who am I? Well, I'm Evie. Um, at work, I mostly have my spend my free time, or like company time, in um, testing and validating uh, new equipment that we have to buy or like we maybe will procure. So we have like a budget. We get testing equipment from vendors, etc. Uh, besides that, most people will probably know me from CCC events doing the network there. And given like the the, the last few years, there has been this whole, like, of course, energy saving discussion and like gas prices, um, and also, of course, with servers getting like taking up more and more resources, more and more power. The the less power they use, the more servers we can cram in one cabinet because we are limited by the um, cooling capacity that we have. So a few caveats about the talk. It's mostly AMD focused, or like at least I will mostly talk about AMD servers and uh, AMD CPUs, how they behave, because while well, we are currently at work run mostly exclusively AMD, um, all the data that I have collected is done at my employer. And um, a lot of the data that I have collected, I have um, uh, well, cross-referenced or validated with other research labs who have done similar measurements uh, to get at least like, they're somewhat accurate at least. Um, so then what is a server or how does a server look like? So uh, we will define this a server as a thing uh, that has at least one CPU and memory. Uh, there will be at, where is my, oh, I need to, no, oh, it's fine then. Um, there will be one or two PSUs. Then there will be an, an uh, IPMI card that's for out of band network. Uh, there will be a, a network card in there. And then for the storage side of things we have uh, a rate card, and then often nowadays there will be two uh, M.2 drives in rate one for boot drives, and then of course we have lots of fans. Um, then the power usage of CPUs over the past few years have been going up and up and up and up. Um, like in 2017, the search we bought were 200 watts, 2019, they are 400 watts, and in 2025, right now, the latest generation that got announced is 500 watts of power. Um, it still has to fit in the same chassis and in the same dimensions. So like the cooling gets a lot more complicated. Um, and the question is, of course, like, is this actually like, what are the, the, the downsides of this more and more? And then on GPU side of things, the, um, the latest announced NVIDIA GPUs currently are rated at one kilowatt each. You have eight of them in your server. So you're at eight kilowatts. Um, cooling that is non-trivial. Uh, getting power to that is also non-trivial. Um, then, okay, so power usage. So what generates the, well, what generates the most heat in a server? If you look at uh, the server, um, the hottest part will be the CPU and memory. That's around 600 watts on modern systems if you fully load it. Drives are often 10 watt each, SSD is 25 watts each. This can add up, for example, you can put 24 SSDs in there. Cooling that gets complicated. Um, PSUs, NIC, IPMI, that's all like 10 watts, doesn't really matter. But it still adds up a lot if you talk about idle power. Um, and of course, a thing that not a lot of people talk about is fans. Fans also take up to 10 to 300 watts of power. Um, that's mostly right now the biggest part of power consumption that we have. Um, but first, let's focus on PSUs. So I think most people are aware of the 80 plus rating. If you ever bought a PSU, there's this 80 plus rating on there. What the 80 plus rating tells you is, if you look at this table, is the amount of power that is allowed to use 
to generate the power. Um, if you, for example, have a titanium plus power supply, the efficiency needs to be at 50% at 96%. Um, this means that 4% can be wasted as heat. Um, but what you also see here is that the optimum range for a power supply to be in is at the 50% load. Going higher, it wastes more energy, but especially in like the lower ranges, for example, 10% load, it's only at 90%. And if you go, for example, for what was sold for quite a while, it's like the 80 plus gold, there is no requirement there. So you can go as low as 70% efficiency. And that, well, it's not that efficient. Uh, then we have the EU, of course. The EU is actually quite nice in this. They have the, this directive, the 20, well, 2009, 12 EC. They were like, all right, we want to calculate or like put limits on how much power a server is allowed to use, idle. So they came up with this lovely complicated formula in EU style. Um, and this, you just plug in the numbers and then a number will roll out and vendors have to uh, stick to this. Uh, of course, the EU being the EU also came up with their own power table of what they're allowed to use, but this is like an identical copy of the 80 plus titanium rating, mostly. So any server that you will buy in the EU will have an 80 plus titanium power supply in there in generally. Um, then how does this look in real life? So if you, for example, take an, uh, a server of an unknown manufacturer, they will have these lovely sheets online, or you can request them for your, for your, from your partner where you buy them from if you buy servers. And this will give you the, their calculations that they did um, if they're like in spec according to the EU. Uh, and the important part which you can see here is that the, uh, the idle state that they measured is 146 watts. Uh, but the, 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 the threshold they were at was 730. So this directive isn't actually that strict. And in my opinion, <laughs> it should be a lot more strict. Um, and then they also specify the maximum power draw that the whole server had doing the tests to get the CPU performance, that's 613 watts. And then the idle state power at the higher boundary of temperature, that is silicon will use more power the hotter it gets. And the hotter the air is in the room, the more power it will also use. So this is at 40C intake air then, for example, it will take, well, like almost 40, approximately 40 watts more than if you do it at like 25C room temperature. Um, <coughs> and this is then how their power supply uh, measurements were, if they were in spec. And again, you can see here too that the optimum spot to be in is at around 50%, according to the EU regulations. Um, then we are at the sort of one, the big thing that a lot of people forget is that a lot of power that a server is using is actually not used to do useful things. Um, fans take the most power normally because you have to cool it. And this is a thing a lot of people do not take into account. And um, the normal like rule is the bigger the fan is in diameter, the less power it uses to move the same amount of air. So the smaller the fan is, the faster it has to spin. And what a lot of people also do not know is that you can have the same system from the same manufacturer with the same specs, but they will have drastically different power usage based on the fans that are in there or the design that they did. And of course, things like idle lanes, idle piece express lanes, risers that are in there, there's nothing plugged into, that all adds up to the idle power and normal power use. So then let's look at some um, normal servers. Uh, there's been lately, well, for a long time, there was this whole discussion about do we take a 1U server, that's like like pizza box format, or do we go a bit bigger with 2U? And the discussion was always, well, I can fit two times as many 1U servers in America as 2U servers. But given like the CPU nowadays does 400 watts instead of 200 watts, um, most manufacturers now have to go to liquid cooling to get it cool in 1U. So the server on the left, if you look at the, uh, well, the lovely arrows that they've drawn, um, there is like this, I, this, this integrated water cooling, this closed loop in the system itself, just to be able to dis dissipate the 400 watts of heat. And of course, it adds complexity and adds cost. Um, and if you look at like a, like a more traditional 2U server, the fans that are in there are a lot bigger. And for example, this system even has two CPU sockets. So it's like, um, yeah, 
the fans will use a lot less energy than that. Uh, then there are also some manufacturers who, who were like, let's be creative. Um, why do we put the memory next to the CPUs? So uh, on the right, for example, you see an IBM Power 10 system. There the memory is moved all the way to the front. So the air will first go through the memory to get cooled, and then it will go to the CPU blocks. Given on memory dims, there are no heat sinks, so the amount of forced air that needs to go over there is a lot, um, needs to be a bit co cooler and move faster. Um, then another thing that a lot of people forget is that doing anything I.O. like, the piece of express, doing disk I.O., talking to subsystems, anything where you have to go to like the analog domain is really, really expensive from a power budget. Um, so like memory, piece express, SATA, whatever you come up with, it's really power hungry. So a good example, for example, is if you take a modern server CPU, no load on there, you will be between 60 and 80 watts, just idling, uh, even though you put no actual work on there. And then if you think that the TDP of the CPU is, for example, 200 watts, then like almost half, if you have like more like at the 80 watt part, more than half of the power draw is only for I.O. The cores itself are like minute. And then another thing is like performance skills are not linear with power. This means it's the faster you need to go, the more power you need to put in there. You, for example, see this at the overclockers, they, for example, need to double the voltage to get only a few percent more um, performance boost. So finding the sweet spot is also uh, an art on its own. And then people are like, oh, well, just put two C CPUs on my server, then I will definitely have double the performance. Also not true, because both zero server CPUs need to talk to each other. This is again I.O. Uh, so the total power that they can actually use for use of compute goes down. And then you're, depending on the vendor and the model and the year, you're at like 175% to 190% actual performance boost. So yeah, this is a bit of the theory, and now actually look at funny graphs, or like fancy graphs, whatever you want to look. So this is the first graph that I want to show you. I hope the numbers are a bit readable. I don't think so, in the back maybe. Um, but this is the PSU efficiency of all servers that we have at work in a bar graph. Um, and then you can see right now that the sweet spot that we are hitting around right now is around 91 to 92%. Um, but we also have like shootouts to more like close to 100% or also as low as 70%. But keeping an eye on this graph is quite useful in the monitoring. For example, if we reboot all the servers, we see the whole graph shift to the left to more like 70% efficiency. And until they're up and running again and there's load on there, they will move closer to the right. Um, then another thing that is uh, a thing a lot of people forget is um, the one you versus two year discussion that I mentioned earlier, this is a graph of the other power usage. So this is fans, I.O. So generally mostly fans, disks, and a NIC of a two-year server and a one year server. Um, power consumption-wise, they're similar. But what you can see here is that there's... So the, the bottom line, that's the, the, the two-year server, and that's around 30 watts. The top line is the two use, like is the one use server, and that's more like 120 watts. So spinning those fans is surprisingly expensive. Um, then of course the question is, do you want this? Is the density worth it? A uh, good example, for example, Cloudflare recently announced that their new generation, the Gen 12 boxes, are now two U instead of one U, especially because of this, because they they do not have the power budget anymore. Um, then a similar thing about um, fans. So if you, for example, put GPUs in a server, your fans often need to spin a lot faster because there needs to be more air to be moved to also call the GPUs in there because server GPUs do not have any fans on them itself. So this is um, a graph of the same chassis, just with one chassis with GPUs in there that are idle and doing nothing. And the other chassis is just no GPUs and the normal fans. And again, what you can see here is that again, the normal fans are around 40 watts and the high powered fans are around 150 watts. So you have a 100 watt increase for just spinning some fans around. And of course, some more, the idle power use of the GPU is also in there, but that's in generally 
not really a huge amount that you can, um, can measure. Then how can we um, save power? So the, so the easiest thing that, that any server that you buy in the EU by now does automatically is you normally have two feeds in your data center for power redundancy in A and B feed. All the servers by default have both PSUs enabled. However, given the sweet spot is in the 50% range, and the PSUs that are in servers are almost always way too overdimensioned for the normal layout that you ship it with, um, it's way more efficient, and this is also what now is sort of required by the EU, is to keep one of the PSUs off and the other on. And if the other, other PSU gets above 50% power usage, the, the controller in the, um, in the server will enable the second power supply for you. Plus it will keep the, the, the second power supply on hot standby. So if the feed falls, or like the feed loses power, it can still kick on the second one almost instantly. Um, and on the right, you can see here, for example, this is um, one of the new clusters we have at work. And every color is a separate feed. And what you can see here uh, is really nicely is that, for example, the top server has first yellow and then red. And then a bit lower, we swapped it around, and then we have red and then yellow. And that's interleaves continuously. And this is because if you have two feet, there is always some inrush current when you power everything on. And if you have all your servers running on one feet, and this feet loses power, and they all swap over to the second feet, then you can have suddenly like 10 kilowatts on the second feet. And your breakers do not like this, in generally. So you can still be like, yes, we have redundancy. And then you lose one feed, and then your other feed also fails. Um, so, <coughs> given these servers, we cannot select in the system what feed, what PSU is active by default. We use the, the beautiful thing called interleaving the things. But for example, Dell servers allow you to on boot randomize which, CPU de, which PSU they use. Uh, and a few other vendors will do the same. Um, yes. Um, so again, with, with like the density question is, one U is like stupid, don't buy it. Um, and the biggest saving right now that you can do is go to water cooling, because you don't have the fan spinning anymore. That's already 100 to 300 watts saved, depending on the power load. And you can go to hot water cooling. This means that you cool your servers with 40 degrees water. This sounds maybe a bit stupid, but the nice thing is it's outside never 40 degrees. Famous last words. Um, <laughs> So, uh, for example, Frontier in the US, that's the current fastest supercomputer in the world, does this. So they just take the water from the, from the, from the servers, pump it outside to big radiators, let it, like, with some fans evaporate, like, well, cool down a bit, pump it back in, and then you pump in 40 degree, you get 80 degree water out. You could even use the 80 degree water to, like, do distributed heating or other things, but it's at least hot enough to do something useful with it. Because if you get 40, 40 C water out of 20 C in, that's useless. By the time it reaches a home, it's like cooled off because of the, the piping. So you need to like increase the, the temperature a lot with that. Um, so yeah, this is like um, a nice outlook on the future. Then another thing that a lot of people forget is let's buy the biggest, baddest server that we have because this is always the best thing ever. But it's always like, if you get the biggest, better server that you have, but you still have like 100 watts idle power usage, if you would, and you, you only load it to like five to 10%, maybe the better thing would be buying a lower end part that idles at 50 watts or 20 watts, and then you use it to 50%, then you're way more efficient. Um, <coughs> so of course, then the thing is, do CPU vendors actually make these CPUs? The answer is sadly no, mostly. Um, and of course, you still need if you want, for example, a Ceph cluster, you need at least three boxes. So do you buy three of the most expensive boxes or go you with three a little bit less powerful boxes? Because otherwise you have three really expensive, power-hungry boxes just idling around draining power. Uh, AMD recently announced the 4004 series and the 8004 series. Those are cut-down versions on the AO side, so they're idle doing a lot less power. And that's quite nice. And the other solution is bigger fans is always better. So there are also some data centers now that just, they have really big fans to blow the air into the, the rooms. Um, they just spin those a bit quicker. So they're just literally forcing the air through the servers. So the fans in the servers just spin a bit slower. Um, then last thing, networking. Of course, servers need switches. 
And switches also use power. That's a bit the sad thing about them. They do not come for free. Um, all the network vendors, if you buy them, will tell you, look, our new box is even more efficient because the amount of watts that we use per gigabit is less than the last generation. What they're not telling you, though, is that they just increased the throughput in the same power budget. So if you used your new switch to the maximum amount of like fully loaded, then yes, your watt per gigabit gets lower. However, <coughs> you're still using more power if you buy the new boxes. So then let's do some quick calculation, some quick bots. Um, if we take, for example, two, server, two switches from Juniper, and the, 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 the last two digits is the generation, so the, the 5130 is newer than the 5110. The 5130 does 400 gig on all ports, the 5120 does 10 gig, but does the 100 gig on all ports. And then the, 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 let's simulate if we would go to less optics. We, we also have a less total throughput of the total server. Because, of course, it goes X4 in the bandwidth that we can handle. So we have to reduce the, um, the amount of bandwidth that we push to the switches. Of course, like one-fourth of 50% is not 10%, but the simulation somewhere or like the modeling that, we, that I have access to from the vendor only has like 50, 30, and 10. So 10 is like, let's be really optimal about them. Um, then the old box uses a maximum of 315 watts. The new box, if we also switch to newer optics, is 349 watts. So that is nine, like 80 watts more. And then if we're saying like, all right, we're going to buy the new box, but keep our optics because we don't want to buy new optics and we still want, well, we have them laying around. Then we're at the new box at 451 watts. So even though the 5130 is more efficient, it's only efficient if you actually use it. And this is again the whole thing of like, um, bigger is not always better. This is the thing a lot of people think. And you can only consolidate so far your servers, given they go faster and faster and faster, you still need three, for example, for redundancy. So even though you, you could like, you have 10 servers, you could reduce it to one, you still need three because redundancy. Um, in a lot of data centers nowadays, the power budget is a limitation. So for example, a rack can do 10 kilowatts or five kilowatts. Um, so then doing one use servers doesn't help because then you can only put one or two in. Like we have a few racks at work, but that has high density servers. There are two servers in the whole rack and then we have the power budget. So it's not really worth it. And then another thing that is always useful, like measure everything. It's always useful to have it if you can do it. And don't un underestimate the differences between vendors. So if you ever want to buy a server, compare them thoroughly to see the power difference. So are there any questions? Because that was my talk. <laughs> I'm actually on time. Any questions? Keine Fragen? Ah doch, Frau. On the, on the EC slide, there is a uh, stat that's like perf CPU. What is that? Uh, the perf, the, the, this, this, this thing, the, um, this one, and uh, which one then? The no, 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 before that, I think? Oh, uh, this one. Yes. Yes, perf the perf watt. CPU. That is um, a set of benchmarks that the EU has decided is a representative. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not looked into the exact details of this because it also depends on the type of workload that the server was designed for. What type of benchmarks you then need to run. Um, I think it's like spec, probably it's like uh, spec int, spec fp, and a few other ones. But again, also because it's the EU, they cannot like say you need to run this commercial benchmark. Um, I, I tried to to locate the exact like testing requirements or like how you could test it, but I couldn't like find it that easily. But it's a number that they have to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> At some point. Yes, exactly.
Um, since we're already at direct CPU power consumption, what is your experience at the moment regarding uh, race to idle or trying to compute slower and use less what? Yeah, so there's a really interesting thing about this. Um, not sure which laboratory this was, but one of uh, one of our sister sites at work, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic, this did uh, with the gas pricing did, did uh, testing to see if we would lower if we would lower the frequency of our CPUs. Um, what's the total power saving that we actually get? And the conclusion is lowering lowering the CPU performance is almost never really worth it. The only thing that's actually worth just turning off boxes. But the thing is, if you run, if you, like we do um, batch workload, so, so we have people submitting jobs and we run the jobs, but we do not know when the job will end. Um, so if you do not know when the job will end, and you also do not know, at, like you often get only 24 hours in, 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 like 24 hours beforehand, a notification that there's a power shortage, please reduce your power consumption. Or even like, if you're lucky like two days in advance, if you kill servers, you also have to restart the jobs. Like the power that is wasted on, on computing the jobs is still being wasted. Um, so there is this um, one of the, uh, the labs in Umia, um, they did um, total CO2 carbon emission emulations then about like, okay, let's not lo only look at the power consumption, but let's look at the total power foot, like CO2 footprint. And the general consensus right now is that the total CO2 emissions that are emitted by actually producing the silicon and the servers is way more than the actual emissions if you would like run it on coal. Um, so there is a model available um, that really simply states if you're on solar power, like if you're in the southern part of Europe, just keep your old boxes running as long as possible. And if you're like in Germany, for example, or in the Netherlands, where there's still quite a lot of dirty power, it's more efficient to replace them more often to like get the total carbon footprint emissions. And this is also a thing, for example, pe people forget with SSDs. The carbon footprint of an SSD is like, because it's silicon that needs to be produced, is way, way higher than hard disk. So even though it's faster, it's, if you purely look at like the carbon footprint of an SSD, it's way worse for the environment than a hard disk, for example. Um, but like, this is all quite complicated and tons of different things that you need to take into account. Do you say um, measure before you buy servers? Yes. How, like, do they get <laughs> give you a server and you're like, okay, um, I will put my it, smart it meter. It depends. It depends. Um, but often, at least, if you if you're big enough that you have to do European tenders, um, and that's quite quickly already. That's if you buy more than two hundred thousand euros worth of servers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> over four year period. <laughs> Uh, like if you're like a somewhat decent sized company, uh, you you almost always can get them on loan, um, or you can get remote access to them to to validate them and and all these like all these power measurements. Um, I forgot to, to mention this. This is all done with sensors that can be read out via the IPMI. So uh, any modern server will give you at l what I've so far seen is give the power input, power output of every power supply, the CPU power usage, the memory power usage, and if you're lucky, also per PCI Express slot power usage. Um, so then you can just get remote access, run your workloads on there, and then get the data out of there. Of course, it's all relative, these numbers. You can compare them between, the, between models, but if you want to make sure that the actual values that come out of these things, you still need to plug in like a validated smart meter, given they can be like a few percent off. And since we're on the topic, um, what is X and what is Y here? Uh, this is uh, X is the percentage of um, uh, power efficiency, and Y is just the count of servers. It's, it's a bar graph. Thank you. I should probably have put it in there, but yeah. Another questions in the room? Okay. Oh, uh, here we have one. So you talked about um, running your old boxes as long as possible in environments where you have clean um, power. Yes. Uh, do you know about a 
market for used servers. Like uh, in Germany, we have to refresh them after three years because they're <laughs> abgeschrieben. And um, <laughs> now I have I have a lot of uh, solar power, and I I can use all the CPU I can I can get. Um, like a, a lot of this is in the end company policy, right? Um, there are, for example, companies that require you to refresh it every every three years. There are resellers that will that will happily take the service from you. They will even give you money for it, um, and they can then resell it again. Um, the other option is, for example, what we use at work, and quite a lot of other things, is that the old boxes become the testing environment. So then you just phase them out. Um, and of course, you can only run them as long as possible if you still have room in your data center. <laughs> That's also a thing that, that comes into account, but uh, that, that, and I know that, but that really depends on the environment. For example, um, there have been cases where, for example, one lab has accepted old retired servers from another lab because they had it left over, and then just they will drive a truck over and rip it out. But there, there, there is not really, besides selling it to a, to a, to a, to a um, refurbishment company, there is no real market for second-hand servers that, that it's all like informal or via these big resellers. And besides that, any company, there's also an EU regulation about this, about not sure if it applies to companies, but there is this uh, e EU waste management regulation that states that any company that sells you equipment has to take it back, um, a, 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 as a consumer at least. Um, so you can just ship it, get shipping labels for that and ship it to them again. And most big companies, or like if you, for example, have, have servers and you buy new servers, they will happily take the old crap for you if you need to get rid of it. Uh, you can just ship it to them and they will deal with all the recycling and all the other, uh, or they will refurbish it. That also often ha quite happens if it's still a supported model for them. So they have spare parts and stuff like that. I hope that sort of answers your question. Another question? I think we have one left. I don't think so. Doesn't, okay. Thanks again for this quite and great talk and have a nice evening, everybody. Yes.